everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for attending the next panel titled AI plus big data equals to much made in heaven for personalized care. My name is Victoria. I'm a medical doctor working in the NHS in England. Um, and I'm really passionate about the topic. I'm excited for um, our discussion today. So we'll start with um, brief introductions from everyone. Today in the panel, we have uh, Dr. Conor Conrad Attert, um, Ken Kasser, um, Indra Joshi, and Martin Castellane. And um, I will let the panel introduce themselves to everyone now. So I'm Conrad. Um, I'm the Deputy Dean of the Faculty of ICT and also a consultant at Mater Day as well as the Chair of the Board of the MSc in Digital Health. I, my research interests are focused on the elderly dementia and the application of IoT in pervasive electronic monitoring. So that's my, my area of interest and a lot of the things we're going to discuss today uh, is influenced by this, the work that I do and the need for AI and big data in this area. So my name's Ken. I'm here last minute, as you can tell, by the contrast between how I look and my picture up on the wall. Um, my co-founder, Angelo, had an accident yesterday and was in the hospital this morning trying to fix his knee. So he asked me to step in last minute. So I'm with a company called Umnai. Umnai is shepherding a new kind of AI technology into the market. It's a very deep technology, which we invented four years ago. Um, it's called, it's based on a foundation called Neural Symbolic AI, uh, which combines the power of traditional neural nets with the explainability, understandability, interpretability of symbolic logic. Great. Hi, everyone. My name's Indra. Um, I'm a doctor by background in emergency medicine. I've worked clinically for a number of years. Um, I currently now work at Palantir Technologies. We're a software firm. For those of you who have not heard about us, we've got Stan downstairs. Come take a look. Um, but we work as well with a lot of big data. We also work in healthcare, so we've been doing quite a bit of work with the national healthcare system in the UK and in the US. Um, and my interest here is I've done a lot of work with a number of companies, both big and small, using data, building AI. And I'm quite interested to see the different views on this panel. Yeah, I'm Martin Kastelein. Um, I've studied information security management, and I'm now working as a, a data and quality manager in a uh, company who's creating a new view on the ECG. And uh, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'll also introduce myself. Um, so I'm a medical doctor by background. Um, I'm a King's College London and Imperial College London graduate. Um, I currently work in gastroenterology in the hospital in Northwest London. Outside of medicine, I have worked in consulting, where I worked on a range of different pharmaceutical and medtech projects. I also completed research in patient safety, orthopedics, and medtech, um, as well as have also worked for a medical startup. Um, so I think that's that's all from introduction side. So we can start the discussion. Um, so. Personalized medicine is a type of um, care that is customized to an indiv individual. Over the last few years, this field has transitioned from ambition to reality. Importantly, research into personalized medicine involves stratifying patients according to factors such as risk profile, um, bio biomolecular data, genetic profiles, and even responses to treatments, and then using all of this data to create targeted interventions or even, you know, predict um, different diseases. Um, so this field is currently developing really fast. However, there is still a lot of stuff and research um, to be done. So at the moment, due to high volume, volumes of data needed, AI and big data have been suggested as two possible solutions that would allow for better delivery and also development of personalized care. Um, so this brings me to the first question that I would like to ask the panel. How do you see the use of AI and big data in personalized medicine? So, there are so, uh, so many times you speak about the applications of this, 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 uh, these tools, big data and AI. 
and uh, many times we try out different things to be able to implement them to be useful and reliable. And as a result, we end up with different solutions which catch up or are in a situation where we find some challenges in implementation. The involvement, so I'm influenced with uh, how the elderly and the professional carers can give a better quality of life for the elderly. So typically our scenario would be that our tools and data is collected in real time or even just in time to be more precise to be able to react immediately. So the personalization in this context gives us a better understanding of the people that we're caring for. As a result, we end up with situations where decisions are taken. And these decisions are influenced by the quality of what we are, we are creating. Now when we speak about big data, we have to understand the context. Because big, when we have a lot of data, it doesn't necessarily mean being big data. And therefore, when we are applying it in a context of healthcare and personalized care, we are doing our utmost to distinguish between the data we are collecting from individuals to the data which is, is reflected to a group of people or to particular domains. And I think here AI makes a distinguish, the, the, helps us out in translating this usefulness of big data in this context. So I think person's data uh, in, in the context of AI and big data is very important, but there's a long way until we can really implement it and use it as we wish it uh, in our, our wish list of things we would like to do. So. I think that um, data and AI will change the way cares and medicine and, and health care is done. You know? How fast will it get there? How many unintended consequences will we have along the way? And how many billions of dollars will we spend going up dead ends? You know, time will tell. But, you know, I wear an Apple Watch and I love the fact that it tells me stuff about what I do every day and gives me a little bit of agency over my own behavior. I think that's fantastic. But I think when you talk about AI and personalized care, what we're looking for is um, a data science concept called the segment of one. Where, you know, when we use data, what we tend to do is we tend to take segments and averages and, and, and things like that, which are, which are great. But if we're going to personalize, we have to somehow get down to a segment of one. And that's going to take a lot of technological development over you know, time for us to get there. But why do we use AI in the first place? You know, what is AI? What does it do? Why, why do we use it? We're, we're, you know, we're humans. We're perfectly capable of looking at data and, and making decisions about it and, and figuring out rules from it. But there comes a certain point where, as humans, the data gets too complicated. That's basically where we start using machine learning. Yeah? When the data is so complicated that we can now no longer write rules for it, if this, then that, then that's the time machine learning comes in. And what machine learning is really, really good at doing is finding rules and patterns in very complex data. So I think absolutely AI and big data will help us get there, and I think we're a fair way from it. I think, I think that's quite a valid point that we're some way, I think when we talk about personalised care, we've just got to be clear of what do we mean. So if I, I can give a few examples in terms of where data is allowing for personalised care, I think we're a bit away from what we're maybe calling precision medicine, which is the individual versus personalised care. So a good example is um, during the pandemic in the UK, we we set up what we call a vaccination program. Lots of countries did the same. But actually what we wanted to know was where were the cohorts of people who might need the vaccination more, i.e. they were at risk, they were clinically um, what we call guarded or shielded, but also they may be in a community who weren't necessarily going to uptake the vaccine for whatever reason, you know, we're not in that to debate it. And so by actually looking at large sets of data, understanding not necessarily um, one pocket, but all these different what we would call factors, so uh, chronic illness, shielding, all the rest of the things I've mentioned, you're able to target populations very well. And so that's something that we did in the UK. We helped the government actually target various areas with the vaccine delivery so that they could um, deliver it more, deliver it better. 
On the flip side, looking at much more individual care, so that's from a population level where big data is showing to be working. And from an individual level, actually what we're seeing as well, there are a number of technologies that are looking, at, so you talked about um, what the human eye can do and then what, what can machine learning do. So there are a couple of companies. One company looks at um, what we call stroke scans. Many of you, I'm assuming there are a few number of clinicians in the room, but if you look at a CT, when it's uh, an acute bleed, knowing that that's an acute bleed and knowing when what we would say the door to needle time and being able to shave off that door to needle time in an acute bleed can make a huge amount of difference. And so it's not in your traditional sense of personalized care, but what it does do is identify those cohorts that need that care at that point in time and allows them to deliver it. And so I think, what, I think AI is a bit of a broad term, but if we say the machine learning in a particular area, for example, in image recognition, you are seeing changes. And we see a lot of that along the, the imaging and the diagnostics pathway. Yeah, I, um, I think we're, we're far away from, from a point where we really can use it in the medical field for personalized care. Um, and that's mainly on the way we collect the data, we share data um, and all the regulations which are not helping for now. But as soon as those uh, bumps are smoothed out, then there might be a chance that uh, the algorithms will help us more. And I guess in the first uh, part, it will be focused on the um, uh, detection of certain diseases and not directly the personalized care. Thank you so much for um, all the points. Um, I, I definitely agree with you, Martin, on the fact that there are quite a few challenges at the moment. We'll discuss them in the future, but I just wanted to firstly touch on a point that you mentioned, Indra, with um, having very specific uses of AI and actually being able to target specific cases in order to allow for that kind of personalized interventions and making sure that the patient outcomes improve in those groups. Um, so I'd just like to ask the panel, is there like any specific area that you think at the moment um, would benefit the most from the use of AI and big data within medicine? Say, is it a specific type of a case or even specialty? So is there, is there one cohort that you see um, we should currently focus on? I mean, when we talk about healthcare, we traditionally go straight to clinical, and that's, that's an unfortunate thing. And if you take a step back, actually, the biggest low-hanging fruit is not in diagnostics, uh, diagnosis, but actually in business. You know, so how do you make a healthcare business better? Um, we, you know, like getting people through a care pathway, understanding data in lots of different systems, if you connect those data up, actually get a much better idea of who needs to be seen when and how. That's one aspect. On another aspect, supply chain, we're all going through the same thing, you know, X, Y and Z is happening in the world and actually getting a better supply chain, making it more economical, efficient. Again, we say AI, but using big data, using um, techniques to analyze all of that, far more efficient and we can see that and it's happening today in many different systems. On the clinical aspect, what you do see is where you have data that can be structured. So you were talking earlier about you know, machine learning. It's very difficult to do it on very unstructured data and actually when you start having good structured labeled data, I'm not a data scientist so forgive me, but building the model then becomes slightly better. The problem in healthcare traditionally is it's so unstructured and it's so messy. And a lot of work we're doing is to try and just clean that data, create those pipes, enable uh, what you would call a nice clean bucket for then people to build applications on top of as and when they want to see it. But um, I was quite fortunate in my previous role, I ran something called a, an AI lab and we funded around 70 to 80 technologies that were doing it. So, if you are interested, we're very happy to share the details of some of those, which are physically doing um, work at the moment. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, so coming back to the challenges, um, we've mentioned some already. Um, the problem of unstructured data and also data that is either limited or is biased is a big issue in the use of AI and big data for creating any kinds of interventions. Um, how do you think we can overcome this problem? Is there a way to overcome it? I'll, I'll take a swipe at that one. 
Um, yeah, bias, bias in data and the um, insufficiency of data, um, as Josh was saying, is, is um, Josh was saying, Indra, sorry, as Indra was saying, um, major problem, it's a legacy, it's a legacy problem as much as anything else. Um, I guess we're all surprised how long it's taking to sort that out <laughs> and get all the ducks in a row. Um, but bias in data is a problem in the context of how machine learning currently learns. Okay? We have a lot of um, what are called opaque algorithms which will learn from data. And if your data is biased, they will learn the bias. And as machine learning is wont to do, it will amplify and accelerate that bias in practice. And as long as machine learning models remain opaque, that will be a problem. But there is a new wave of technology coming where machine learning models become transparent. And when that happens, the bias in the data becomes less important. Because if you can then determine where those biases are in the machine learning model, you can correct them before the point of impact. So there are solutions on the horizon for biased data, but generally the quality of data, the ability to collect clean, structured, commonly understood data is just, it's, it's a huge problem. Yeah, but there's a reason why this is a problem. Because we still can't work together to, to uh, align the data that is being generated all the time. Even through hospitals, it's very hard to find a legal framework or policies that unify this data in a structured way. Because the systems and technologies, in a way, although there is a lot of space for improvement, are there. But unless these policies change and the right softwares and companies work together, not only in, in the local region or within a, a hospital or within a, a particular country, but across, we're going to have this, these challenges. We are about 15 different institutes around, around the world working on the same project in different ways. And we are doing our utmost that our research and our data, which is being collected, is done in a certain structure so that our work, because we can't do it on our own, can be of, of use for who is going to benefit from it. So when we say, speak about data, we obviously have to see how we are, what effort are we doing to achieve that. Because technologies can be there and we can invent. Uh, you were just speaking about your, the products that you, that, that you are offering and, and, and the models and everything. But if the data is, is again, always source of challenge, we are going to be stuck. And obviously all the, the things around which I believe we'll discuss about uh, GDPR, et cetera. So if there isn't a structure within the entities that allows us to use that data, we can have uh, some of it, but not complete. A challenge that we have found in particular work we've done because we can't take all the data, it's there, but we can't access it for different reasons. I have, a, I, have a, I have a thought that I'd just like to actually direct towards Indra. So I guess one of the best examples we've seen of collecting data and keeping it private is probably Apple, frankly, with their wearable devices and, and the things at least they promise that they're doing in terms of keeping your data private and safe. What do you think of that? Is that, is that the path forward for personal I think data? In healthcare, we're very fortunate. So we actually have quite a number as a healthcare industry rules and regulations. So you have a lot of um, acquisition of data depending on what you're doing. Are you doing research? Are you doing a trial? Whatever it might be, you actually have to gain approvals. And so as an industry, we're quite fortunate that we have to go through that. If you're building, I know there was a panel earlier talking about AI regulation, again, there are a lot of different bodies, medical devices, etc., which allow you to, to have to follow some rules. What doesn't currently happen, and then we're quite fortunate here in the, U in, in the EU that we have the GDPR, again, which protects um, a lot of individual data privacy rights. What doesn't necessarily happen is around that wider understanding. And the EC, EC the European Commission, they're doing a lot of work currently around AI regulation, which I think will help all of that. But at the end of the day, we talk a lot about um, personalized data. And I think there is, going back to Apple, I think where they have done it well, is they put the person in the center of that care. 
And so often, medicine is patriarchal. It's, I, the clinician, know best. I know how to handle what's your information. And actually, if you put the person in the middle, you allow them the autonomy and the empowerment to do what they need to do, you start changing that dynamic. And it's very difficult at the moment. I mean, you know, we've all come across a number of difficult characters in our lives where it's very hard to kind of break that mold of, I know best, you are the, the patient, the citizen, therefore you must listen to me. I will fix you. I will fix you versus let me help you fix you. Because that's, that, that's an important question. Why is it Apple that is taking the lead on this and not having uh, an independent uh, solution that is much more accessible? So that's a concern that I will always have. Who takes lead in this, in this uh, competition of, of personalized data and technology? I agree. These are all very good points. And it, it is a very challenging topic. So um, we, we definitely need to do more work in this area. Um, but just to touch upon a different topic now, um, one of the problems that we currently face in medicine in terms of firstly developing and designing treatments, but also then actually giving them to individuals is um, the problem of data that is biased. And quite often, some uh, populations are actually underrepresented in that data. So say women or uh, people from ethnic backgrounds they are very unlikely actually to be found in the research studies and that eventually does impact on um, the outcomes that you get in, um, say, when you develop treatments. Um, do you think um, that AI and big data um, will be able to bridge those health inequalities through developing personalized medicine with the use of these solutions? I guess the big question we have to answer before is do we trust the machine to be smarter than the doctor? Because as long as we don't trust the machine, we can create all the algorithms which are true, but then it will st still not be used because it will always be discussed as it can be the truth as long as a doctor has a different opinion. So I think, I think when you talk about when you talk about bias and data, you know the way I like to look at it is what is data? Data is a codification of history. Yeah? So when we have biased data that means that we have data that is biased because the humans that made the decision that was then codified into that data were biased. So we don't really have a data problem, we have a human problem. You know why are ethnic minorities underrepresented in studies? Because humans are biased. Was I reading a month ago that they, they've now, somebody got lauded for building the first an autonomically correct female crash test dummy? No, that's insanity. This is a human problem. It's not a technology problem. I would agree. There was a case uh, from a British university where they built an algorithm to help them um, sift, sift through applications for medical school, but it was built on what was traditionally used as criteria to get into medical school, and therefore the bias continued. We continued to you know, interview those who came from good schools, et cetera, et cetera. And that was, that was. I think to address that, we have to purposefully go out. And so I know there are a lot of funding streams which are purposefully saying, have you addressed these various issues? Do you have a PPI panel, a patient participation panel? Is it diverse? Have you looked at the different areas that are you're naturally blind to? And I think the more as a community we can we can vocalize that and push for that as both tech companies but also as a, you know, as a cohort who understands this, the change will happen. But we've got to make that change. We can't rely on you know, that change to just sort of magically happen. One of, one of the things I do think will happen, which, which is I do think that to a degree, data and machine learning will start to help us keep the humans in check. Okay? Because why do we talk about bias more today than we did 15 years ago? Because now we have the data to measure. 15 years ago, we didn't. 15 years ago, you worked in a hospital, a doctor was biased, and you all complained about him in the coffee room. And that was pretty much, now we actually measure this stuff. So we've kind of got the data is, is going to start keeping the humans honest. And then maybe that starts a virtuous, a virtuous cycle of us sorting the problem out. Um, 
I, I definitely agree with this point, um, especially in terms of data um, and it, it, this big being the human problem. Um, so I, I, I'm quite aware that we've actually reached the, the end of the time. So I would like to thank the um, panel for attending and participating and contributing to this discussion today. And I would like to thank everyone for also being here today. Um, I'm not sure if there's any time for questions. Do we, do we have a few minutes, two minutes? Okay. Um, does anyone from the audience have any questions for the panel? Yes? Feel that technology a little selfishly. Um, yes, there is. Um, there's technologies emerging, and we happen to have one of them that will identify precisely where the bias is in the data and in the model, and it can do so in real time, allowing you the opportunity to correct the bias in a real time decision flow prior to the consumption and impact of that decision. So, technology is emerging be anonymized, I guess. You should... Data privacy and bias are two entirely separate issues. Well, the, I guess there will be a an, an, an point where they will reach each other, as in, you cannot... The, 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 we want public data for, for, the, for the algorithms and to, to test it all, but we have the, the, the flip side that it will cost you your privacy in your own data. So... Potentially, you understand the... That's a big problem that we have, but the fact that, that people's identities don't communicate data, it's, it's different frameworks, different softwares, yes, etc. And therefore, the choice of who takes ownership and starts leading with policies that come from governments, ideally, that help to enable that. We find this so much, because we work with healthcare and day home and residential homes for the elderly, etc. There's so yes. much. But you need policies, so the technologies can be there, but if the policies are not there. Okay, I, th I think we don't have time for more questions, but thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for the questions as well. Um, I think there are some good points that we need to think about, especially in terms of actual policies that are in place um, and whether they allow for data sharing or not, which is a big issue at the moment. Um, so thank you. Um, I think the next panel will start in a second.